Okay, please have your Bibles to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. And before we get to Revelation chapter 20, just an additional thought to what we looked at yesterday, the so-called second blessing. And uh, you might be interested to know that the term and the doctrine for the second blessing is actually a Catholic one. Just after the Reformation, the Catholics started to teach this second blessing, that you needed to be filled with the Holy Ghost, to pretty much give you salvation. And that doctrine trickled down into some of the post-Reformation leaders, like John Wesley, for example, who was known to have some pretty uh, interesting services, shall we say. And John Wesley was a saved man, don't get me wrong, but at times he would get caught up in the hysteria of speaking in tongues or rolling around on the floor, so much so that uh, one of his contemporaries would rebuke him, a well-known Calvinist preacher. And as the centuries went by, this doctrine became more prevalent, and that's why if you ever come into contact with charismatics especially, they make such a song and dance about speaking in tongues, or prophesying, or receiving visions, so on and so forth. But technically, that doctrine, that belief, is a Catholic one. And that's why charismatic Catholics are so popular with charismatic Protestants. In fact, there was a... Chap in the, uh, there was a chap some years ago who's now dead called uh, David Wilkerson and uh, he spoke about Catholic charismatics being his brethren and uh, he was very popular in New York and we had a friend at the time who appreciated the work that we were doing at our ministry and he was very upset with me because I was speaking against <coughs> David Wilkerson and people such as him and he wrote to me and he said uh, we had Brother Wilkerson at our church some years ago and uh, he was a very good man. He came over here, gave some talks, so on and so forth. And I got back to this brother in uh, Northern Ireland from memory. And I said to him, well, David Wilkerson made many false prophecies. And I gave him a list of these prophecies, which are online, which people can read. And uh, one of his prophecies was that charismatic Catholics would continue to grow. And that was evidence that God was working through the Catholic Church. Bizarre statement, if not blasphemous. And this friend of our ministry in Northern Ireland pretty much cut links with us over David Wilkerson. Well, that view has continued to grow, and most, if not all, charismatics believe in the second blessing, or the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But, like I said yesterday, I believe in the second blessing when it comes to being filled with the Holy Ghost. As one great preacher once said, we are like leaking vessels. We need to be filled with the Holy Ghost every day, and that's true. We should be praying for boldness. We should be praying to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Yes, we got baptized when we were saved by the Holy Ghost and put into the body of Christ, but we still leak. We still need to be topped up, as it were. And therefore, when I hear these people going around saying, have you seen the Holy Ghost and do you speak in tongues and so forth, it's just bizarre thinking because, like I said last time and over the last several weeks and months, most of those in Acts Apostles never spoke in tongues. And yet, to listen to, to, listen to some of these people, you would think it was the other way around. But that's not how it was whatsoever. So hold that thought in mind because you will sooner or later come into contact with such people and they will shake your faith. They will say to you, if you don't speak in tongues, you're not saved. And you just gently remind them that Paul, when he was saved, didn't speak in tongues. The Philippian jailer didn't speak in tongues. In fact, when Paul was speaking to some ladies on a Sabbath evening, I think it's in Acts 16, they got saved and there's no mention of those women speaking in tongues. Tongues, according to 1 Corinthians 12-14, to was the least of all of the gifts. And yet again, you would think it was the greatest of all of the gifts. Also, I will say this, that we can't rule out the Jesuits were responsible for such a doctrine. Their whole purpose was to not only reverse the Reformation, but to destroy the Reformation. And they are still very active today. They've never forgiven Britain for breaking away and giving us the King James Bible. And therefore it is a great shame you hear about greats such as Wesley getting caught up in this hysteria. I'm not sure that Wesley ever spoke in tongues per se, but what I know from my research about Brother Wesley, and yes he was a saved man, was that he didn't stop such activity occurring. So much so that George Whitfield, a great Calvinist preacher, would rebuke him for allowing his meetings to become almost bordering hysteria. But for today, I want to look at Revelation chapter 20. And over the last nine or ten days, I've slightly lost count, we've been able to meet every morning and read the Word of God, look at the Scripture, 
and hopefully get a blessing as to what the Word of God has for us. We are Bible believers. We don't go by our feelings or emotions. We're not mystics. We're not prophets. We're not psychics. We're Bible believers. And there's too much talk about sharing one, uh, sharing each other's experiences, sharing this and sharing that, and really not even taking the time to study the Word of God. And yes, I will say it's a quick footnote that Catholics do read their Bibles, but they don't study their Bibles. They don't examine their Bibles. When I say Catholics, I mean those at the higher level of Catholicism. If you're an ordinary lay Catholic, the chances are you won't read the Bible whatsoever. In fact, most Christians don't read their Bibles every day. Maybe twice a week, maybe three times a week. But they don't read it. They don't examine it. They don't do what we're going to do this morning. So let's look at Revelation chapter 20, and let's see what the Lord will show us this morning. And let's start, if we may, in verse 1, please. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. You've got a literal angel coming down from a literal place called heaven, with a literal key in his hand. And this key is for the bottomless pit. On top of that, he has a great chain in his hand. Let me say this, that one of the problems with the scriptures, and I will qualify that uh, expression clearly, is that some verses need to be spiritualized, others need to be taken literally. For example, in John chapter 6, you were told to eat the Lord's flesh and drink the Lord's blood. Now we know that such talk is what is referred to as figurative language, hyperbole language, spiritual language. We don't literally eat his flesh or drink his blood. From Matthew chapter 5, we were told to pluck our eyes out or cut our hands off if we were lusting after a woman, or if a woman was lusting after a man. It goes both ways. Again, that's hyperbole language. We don't take that literally. But here, I have no reason whatsoever to take this piece of scripture and spiritualize it. Because angels were literal beings. Heaven is a literal place. A key can be literal, and a pit can be literal, and on top of that, a chain can be literal as well. So I don't want to spiritualize these passages and uh, give you the impression that it's to be taken in a spiritual sense. If you do that, especially with Revelation, you will lose so much light. In fact, I put it to you this morning, you won't even be able to understand this book if you spiritualize it. And that has been the mistake of many greats over the years. And I will, I think of Augustine, the first Catholic doctor, so-called, of the Catholic Church. And he wasn't a great, incidentally. But uh, he spiritualized Revelation. And he influenced an entire generation of like-minded people and then the Reformation came along, and John Calvin and co. followed Augustine. In fact, John Calvin would refer to Augustine as his revered father. And I feel sometimes that Calvin's love for Luther, and also Luther's love for Augustine, was bordering on pastor worship. You can appreciate someone's ministry, of course you can, but when you start to refer to them as, ho as reverent father, and uh, his theology is holy within me, quote-unquote, and... It, extensively quoting Augustine's City of God for Calvin's police state in Geneva. You fall into all sorts of problems. And that's why, as far as I'm concerned, the Reformation never went far enough. 2. And laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent which is a devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should see the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that he must be loosed a little season. He laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is a devil and Satan. It's the same person. And I've heard people say that, when they read the scripture, they think Satan and the devil are two different people. No. He's a dragon, he's a serpent, he is a devil. It's almost like three parts to his office, the unholy trinity, if you will, but the same person. And he's been bound for a thousand years. And I mean a literal thousand years of time. Not a spiritual... Uh, description of time but a literal description of time and this is the first of several references to the thousand years the thousand year reign of Christ the millennial kingdom something all Bible believers should be working hard to enter into because you don't get it automatically yes when, once you're born again you are in the kingdom of God in a spiritual sense of course you were told in John chapter 3 you can't even see it until you're born again but my understanding of the scriptures is that you have to live a certain way after you are saved by grace to get all the rewards, all of the crowns. And people say, well, what happens if you live after the flesh after you're saved? What happens if you don't put the flesh to death? What happens if you do your own thing or you become a perpetual backslider? Well, you're with the Lord. 
wherever he is, that's where we are. We know that from First Thessalonians chapter 4. But to have crowns, to have thrones, to have dominions, to have angels, and perhaps peoples under you as well, is going to be conditional on how you lived after you were saved. So when it comes to your inheritance, there's everything to play for. But here this angel, just an angel, also from verse 1, not the angel of the Lord, not Michael, not Gabriel, which you would think it would be, but just an angel was sent down to bind, to bound, to incarcerate the devil for a thousand years. Why? Well, because the Lord will be on the earth, ruling and reigning for a thousand years. And you would have thought that with Satan bound for a thousand years, there'll be peace on the earth, and it'll be rosy and uh, wonderful, but the truth of the matter is, People will be born in the millennium, people will need to be saved in the millennium, and people will die in the millennium as a result of their sin. Now we as church age saints, we are going to be given spiritual bodies at the rapture, or of course if we die before the rapture, we get new bodies, and those bodies are going to rule and reign forever. We can't be in the Lord's uh, presence without imputation, without justification, and on top of that without new bodies. So we know that when the thousand years commences we have new bodies but those in the tribulation that get saved are going to be meeting the lord matthew 25 on the earth not heaven and they're going to be judged and those that were saved go into the millennial kingdom and it's those people that are going to repopulate the new heaven and the new earth of course the earth will be here the heaven will be above the earth some people think it's going to be descending from heaven or hovering above the new earth i'm not really sure about that but the new Jerusalem will be for the body of Christ, and the new earth probably for the children of Israel, those that were saved. But hold that thought. Look at verse 4, please. And I saw thrones, and then it sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither received his mark upon their foreheads, saw on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. I saw thrones, I saw dominions i saw power bases i saw those that are ruling sitting upon such thrones and judgment authority was given unto them and i saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of jesus we know from scripture that a soul or a soul of a person is a bodily shape that is found in luke chapter 16 the rich man in hell has eyes he can see he has a tongue and he can also speak we also know from Revelation chapter 6 how there are people that have been martyred who are probably in the ground awaiting the resurrection to be judged for their works. They're saved to get their rewards. And they too are pictured with having you know, bodily shaped souls. Some people say, no, my soul is grieved today. My soul is vexed today. Or my soul is this or my soul is that. That's just describing their spirit. That's just describing how they feel, their mood, their emotional state. But as a Bible believer, I know that we have a bodily shape, or our soul is a bodily shape. My soul is inside my body, and my soul is probably the same size as my body. But this crowd of people have been beheaded, an interesting description, for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God. David, when he came up against Goliath, beheaded him. And Goliath was a Philistine, and the Philistines feed into the Palestinians, and the Palestinians, of course, are predominantly Muslim. But here you've got saved people having their heads removed, beheaded, cut off. And you look around the world today and you see many Islamists taking people captive and beheading them. Also, we can't rule out the use of the guillotine during the tribulation period. It's a very quick, easy and cheap way to kill people. And yet, during the Second World War, to the best of my knowledge, not many people were put to death with the guillotine. That was a problem that the Nazis had. How do we kill people? What's the most cost-productive way to do it? What's the quickest way to do it? And they came up with the awful idea of gassing many Jews and then burning them in the ovens. Some went into the ovens alive, mostly went in dead. Some were shot in the back of their heads. But that's always been their problem. What do you do with the bodies? Many serial killers over the years have struggled to get rid of people's bodies. I was reading a while ago that back in the 50s and 60s in America, the mafia had the great idea of buying mortuaries. And you say, why would they do that? Well, they can get rid of the bodies, of course. They'd kill their victims and take them to the local mortuary and they'd be dissected or whatever they do with such people and they could easily dispose of the bodies. But here you've got saved people that have been beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God. The Antichrist will be an awful dictator. As a student of 
history, I think. Hitler was pretty bad, and he was. Uh, Saddam Hussein was pretty bad, and he was. Idi Amin was pretty bad, and he was. And these are just recent leaders over the last 60, 70, 80 years. But when Antichrist arrives, he's going to be the worst possible type of leader the world has ever seen or could ever have had the misfortune of being ruled by. And he will cut people's heads off, and he may even televise it. Islamic states like to televise their executions. They like to get people to come in, and I mean young people, to come in and watch people having their heads removed. And for some people, it's entertainment. In fact, in Saudi Arabia, when someone gets a flogging, that gets televised. When someone is thrown off a building for committing particular sins, that is televised. And people enjoy it. People are very bloody. I was told by an old gentleman in my town that back in World War II, near the town hall steps, they had a hanging section where they would hang individuals, those that were found guilty of treason, those that were found guilty of crimes which warranted the death penalty and the whole town would go out and watch people being strung up also from the second world war we know that the nazis are very good at killing people with piano wires i think dietrich sponifer a very questionable character was strung up by a piano wire man is very cruel man's inhumanity to man is just shocking and that's what happens when you're not saved in fact an atheist came up to me a few days ago in greenwich and he was fuming and he said to me uh Where's your God? Your God is a blankety blank. I shan't repeat what he said. And he said to me, if your God is real, why did he allow this to happen? And I said to him, my God is real, but because you people don't receive him, you reject him, this is what you get in his place. Islamic states, the Third Reich, Pol Pot, Idi Amin, abortion on tap in the UK 24-7, taxpayers' money paying for it. Canada has passed a law, which I need to check this, but what I saw briefly on, on online the other day, they passed law which now says that certain acts of bestiality are legal. That needs to be checked. I may have misread that, but that's what I think I saw. I'm pretty sure I saw that. In fact, I did see it, but I didn't check it in great detail. If that's the case, then you really do get the governments that you deserve. But here, Antichrist, tribulation, is going to kill those that believe in the Lord, Jews and Gentiles, by beheading them. And if you want to go through the tribulation, you go for it. I'm pre-tribulational. I make no apologies for that. I'm already saved. I'm already in heaven, according to Ephesians 1 and 2, John 5, 24. My sins have been forgiven, according to Romans 8. There's no judgment on me. I'm as saved as I'll ever be. Am I as sanctified as I'll ever be? No, of course not. I could always do more to be more sanctified. I could always say no to the flesh more often and watch my mouth and, you know, my thought life. Of course I could. <coughs> but my justification is fixed. I'm saved. But this poor group of people in the tribulation are beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God. Why? which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. We have that technology today. Animals are being chipped in case they go missing. We read an article some years ago that certain members of the royal family may have been chipped in case they are kidnapped. They can be found upon their foreheads, in their hands. The detail here is just so explicit. And that's why I say again, don't make the mistake of spiritualizing this great book. As somebody once said, it's not hard to understand. It's hard to believe because it's so clear. Without this book, we'd have no idea how everything is going to play out in the last days. Verse 5. And the rest of the dead live not again until a thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. You've got at least two resurrections in the word of God. But the unsaved dead that are cited here, and they must be unsaved, live not again until a thousand years were finished, has to be in reference to the unsaved dead, the unsaved wicked dead. And I'm thinking from probably creation to Calvary, from Calvary to the end of the thousand years. The rich man in hell, Luke 16, is still in hell today. And Luke 16, 19 to 31 is not a parable. Again, don't spiritualize that. People that spiritualize the scriptures, nine times out of ten are apostates. They've got sin in their lives. So they can't perceive or even want to accept the fact that they will live forever. In fact, three New Age people came up to me also in Greenwich a couple of days ago, and they said to me, I am eternal, and all sons of God. And I said to them, no, you're not eternal. Your soul is eternal, I grant you that, but you as a person are not eternal. And we're not sons of God until we are born again. In fact, the Word of God tells me that we were children of the devil before we were saved, and he didn't like that at all. And he stormed off with his two buddies. But here, the rest of the dead live not again until a thousand years are finished. Millennial reign, this is the first resurrection. But keep verse 5 in mind when it comes to 
being in reference to the unsaved wicked dead. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection, on such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Resurrection from the scripture primarily is in reference to Israel, but the church is more in reference to the rapture. So the rapture is in reference to the church, the resurrection is in reference to Israel. This book, Revelation, is a Jewish book. Every Jewish Messianic believer will tell you this is a very Jewish book. Even unsaved Jews will tell you this is very Jewish. So it speaks about the first resurrection here. It's not speaking about those of us sitting around this table this morning. We've already had our judgment. We've already been resurrected with Christ. We've been with him for a thousand years on the earth. This is probably speaking about the saved dead, who are now going to get new bodies. Why? To rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. And yet most people think that there's only one resurrection. And that's a mistake. In fact, when we got saved, according to... Romans chapter 6, we were resurrected with Christ. This goes back to what I said a few moments ago from Ephesians 1 and 2, how we are already in heaven. And therefore you have to hold to eternal security, because if you don't, how do you understand your salvation? You've been resurrected with Christ, you've died with Christ, you've been baptized with Christ, you're sitting with Christ, you are in Christ, and Christ is in you, as is the Father and the Holy Ghost. Now this piece of scripture is not speaking about the church at all. The church has been reigning with him for a thousand years, of course, depending on how you lived after you were saved, you understand. Let's read on, verse 7 please. When a thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them t- together to battle, the number of whom is as a sand of the sea. The millennial kingdom has been and gone. We've been with our king for a thousand years. We've had our mansions for a thousand years. We've had angels under our authority, under our submission to us, or under submission to us. But now Satan, the devil has been loosed out of his prison. Why? Because he's going to gather the nations, which are enemies of the Lord, to come up and attack the Lord God of the Bible. And this may help us to explain why Satan is allowed to attack us as saved people. You think to yourself, why does the Lord allow the devil so much leeway? We know from scripture how he goes into heaven and blasphemes the saints. And he still does have access into heaven. People say, no, 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 that's been a God. No, that is still relevant for today. He'll go into heaven and he'll say, look at this person over here. Look what she's doing. Look at this man over there. Look what he's doing. And the Lord says, yes, but he's covered by the blood. And that drives the devil mad. But here, Gog and Magog, Russia to some extent, is going to come against the Lord's people, Armageddon, to attack the Lord and his people. And this causes a lot of confusion amongst premillennial Bible believers. When does this happen? Before the tribulation? At the end of the tribulation? Or after the thousand years of Christ? Well, it's clear to me, it happens at the end of the thousand years before we go into eternity. Which shows me that during the thousand year reign of Christ, many people have died in rebellion against the Lord Jesus Christ. It's hard to imagine, isn't it? He came, he ruled, people were born initially to save parents, but they didn't retain their parents' faith and ended up becoming enemies of the Lord's people. And also they formed into what looks like a picture of one's nationality, Gog and Magog, found back in Ezekiel. When Christ came the first time, he wanted people to believe on him. And if you didn't believe on Christ the first time, you went to hell. During the millennial kingdom, you need to believe on him to be saved. And yet some of our dispensational brethren say, no, in the millennial kingdom, you just need works and not faith. That makes no sense whatsoever. Christ told you, unless you believe I am, you would die in your sins, first coming. How can that be any different to when he comes a second time? Why would it be any different? God has always demanded faith in himself. That's what saves us. Our faith in him, which then produces works. But the tragedy is, and I will conclude in verse 8, that many people are going to be deceived from the four quarters of the earth. North, south, east, west. Not just a few people, but from the four quarters of the earth. And they're going to be deceived by the devil. They're going to go up against the Lord. It's a suicide mission, of course. And the Lord is going to destroy them all. This goes back to original sin. This goes back to how sinful man is. We have a sinful nature. We are depraved. Not in the sense that the Calvinists would have us believe, so-called total depravity, the T in their tulip, meaning you don't know right from wrong, and you're so dead you can't even tie your shoelaces. No, we are dead in our sins, the word of God tells us that. But because we are so depraved, after 1,000 years of the king reigning on the earth, treason has been detected. This conspiracy has been rediscovered. And the devil has come up out of hell, which also shows me that there's no annihilation. He's been detained for 1,000 years in a pit chained up, and that has got to be a reference, has been reference to a place called Tarsus, where the angels went, where they were bound, and they don't burn up. And that's why, if you are a Bible believer, as much as you'd like to say hell isn't forever, it is forever. And you're conscious forever. 
you don't cease to exist. I gave the scripture some weeks ago or some days ago from uh, Luke 15, how the prodigal son perished with hunger. But he didn't starve to death. He perished with hunger. And you can perish in hell and yet not burn up. You'll always burn forever. There's no pitch of being annihilated. So I'll close there in verse 8 and I'll pick it up next time in verse 9.